Hello again. This is the story of the Old Testament. This is going to be part six in which we look at the uh, young life of David. We're going to spend two sessions talking about David because he's such an important figure in the Old Testament. And uh, the stories associated with David are so entertaining. Uh, he's believed to have been born around 1040 B.C. during the reign of Saul and was anointed by Samuel to be the next king when he was about 15 years old. Saul had disobeyed the Lord, and uh, it was determined that David would succeed him on the throne, but this event wouldn't actually happen for, another, for an additional 15 years when David was about 30 years old. The young boy, the, the shepherd, became a hero in his nation after he defeated Goliath, the, this, this enormous Philistine champion, in single combat. Uh, girls wrote stories, uh, they, they wrote songs and poems and danced in the street and, and uh, uh, told stories about David. And uh, the young David became a staple of religious art, especially uh, the David that was um, uh, created by Michelangelo. And this is probably the most uh, famous of uh, any representation of David that there is. Uh, this magnificent statue is on display in Florence. However, <laughs> it almost certainly is not what David looked like uh, at the time of his uh, combat with Goliath. This may very well be um, a more accurate representation. I think this picture was taken in the 1930s, and it's a uh, Bedouin shepherd with his, with his flocks and uh, his robes and his stick that he used to help guide the, help guide the, uh, the sheep. But uh, we are also given a, um, a Bible passage about um, what David looked like, as we did with Saul. And this is kind of an interesting um, passage. It says that David was ruddy. He had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then it goes on to describe how Samuel anointed him. Uh, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Now, an anointing was a, uh, an indication that you had been selected, and it was a, um, a spiritual anointing and laying on of hands, as well as pouring on the oil. And this is a, a common representation of how David might have been anointed by, uh, by Samuel at the time. Now, since the arrival in the 1100s, uh, the Philistines had become uh, the active enemy of the Israelites. Uh, they started out on friendlier terms, as we've discussed, but there had been several major battles fought between the two nations. Uh, they continued to battle uh, one to an uh, one another uh, through the reign of Saul. And at the um, uh, latter part of Saul's reign, there was a battle in the Elah Valley, uh, this has been dated to about 1025 B.C. As we mentioned before, the Elah Valley is a narrow east-west valley through the foothills that allowed people from the coast to get up into the hill country. And it was there that the Philistines lined one edge of the valley and challenged the Israelites to fight with their various champions. Let's take a look at where the Elah Valley was again. We have the uh, Israelites up in the hill country with the Philistines along the coast. And the Elah Valley was a, uh, an area where you could get from one region to the other uh, with the least amount of difficulty. If we look at this satellite photo, this is looking north. You can see the very rugged hills of uh, Judea on the right. And that purple smudge in the upper right-hand corner is the modern city of Jerusalem. Uh, down to the left, you can see the foothills and getting into the coastal plain. And the Elah Valley is a small area that connects it. Now, this was a particularly strategic valley because there were very few places where it was possible to get from the foothills up to the top of the Judean range without following a ridge which would make it easy to, uh, to uh, travel from one area to the other. And what you see with the arrow there is the ridge route that was in the southern part of the Judean hills. Uh, if you travel to the north a little bit further, you can see how rugged the terrain was, and it was very difficult to travel through that area. 
If we go back to the uh, view of the um, Elah Valley, you can see that it's a long, narrow uh, area, and it would be uh, possible for an army to align itself on one, uh, on one side of the valley and the other army to array itself along the opposite valley, opposite side of the valley, and then call out challenges across to each other as, um, as they did uh, for an extended period of time. Now, David was an adept with the sling. Uh, we were told that uh, he conquered Goliath with a sling, and there are people who are skeptical of such a story. A trained soldier fighting a uh, shepherd boy with a sling uh, is uh, somewhat fanciful to most people. However, the sling was a military weapon. There are entire uh, corps and groups and armies and platoons that are mentioned in history that were made up simply of slingers who provided uh, covering fire for an attack. Uh, you had swords and spears and bows and arrows, of course, and these are weapons that were beyond the, uh, the ability of the peasantry and people not in the military, but anybody could make a sling. It was a small pouch with a couple of strings attached, and you'd put a stone in it, and by swinging it around your head and then letting go of one end of the sling, the stone would fly out at a, at a very fast uh, pace and could uh, seriously injure whatever it hit. Uh, I have seen an old video uh, years ago of an Arab boy. It was, a, uh, it was a black and white movie that was made, actually, and he used his sling to knock a bird out of the sky that was flying by. So it would be possible to be very accurate with that. And as a shepherd boy, with David spending day and night, week after week, out in the field with nothing to do, no books, uh, no, no iPads, nothing to entertain himself, uh, he would use the sling and most likely would throw it at um, would would throw it at, uh, other boys and um, at, at, at any of the predators that would come and attempt to uh, catch his, his flocks. In fact, we're told he killed bears. These would have been the small Asian bears, and then the same thing with the small lions. So he was very capable uh, with a weapon that was used also by the military. Now, if you consider the weaponry that was uh, used by Goliath, it was an entirely different sort. He was covered with very heavy um, armor, a helmet, um, a chest protector, uh, uh, his, his uh, greaves on his legs and so forth, and he had a shield. But his weapon was a sling. I'm sorry, his weapon was a sword, which has a limited reach, he was also said to have had a javelin, but this was a, a uh, stabbing javelin as opposed to a throwing javelin, and so he would again be restricted to the reach of that particular weapon. Now let's take a look at it. Here is a uh, relief, an Assyrian relief, showing Assyrian soldiers with slings in their hand, and uh, if you look in their other hand, they're carrying another stone, another weapon. You would use this to... Uh, throw at your opponent. If you hit him in the arm or, or in the body, you would stun him or hurt him, and then the stone would fall to the ground, and you could pick it up and then use it again. It was a renewable weapon. And here is an actual sling stone that was discovered at the excavation of Makater, which was the site of a battle. And then this is my favorite representation of David and Goliath. I think it's uh, fairly accurate. We have this enormous, Goli uh, this enormous uh, Philistine champion, Goliath, with his weaponry. He has um, a helmet and a shield and his uh, chest plate and the greaves on his legs. He has a sword and a spear or a javelin. But David has a sling. And he's able to stand back 10 or 15 or 20 feet and still use that weapon with great accuracy. And it would be that way that he could uh, balance the, uh, the, 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 the weaponry between the two of them, and he would be able to, with a sling stone, strike Goliath in the one place in his body where he was vulnerable, his face. Uh, we have stories of baseball players being hit by baseballs uh, in, in the same area and uh, suffering tremendous injury. Uh, this would have stunned Goliath. He then would have fallen. And uh, once he fell onto the ground, uh, David would have been able to, um, 
pick up the sword of Goliath and cut his head off, and then um, this would cause the panic in the Philistine armies, and they, they would flee. It's a very believable story, and uh, it's perhaps the only way that Goliath might have been conquered on that particular day because he certainly, in traditional battle, uh, had the advantage over any of the Israelite soldiers. Now, with their champion killed, the Philistines fled and they were slaughtered. David became a national hero, and as we mentioned before, he was taken into the household of the king. The king uh, brought uh, into the army, and in this case, into his household, young, strong, brave soldiers that he could use in the army. Now, as David matured and grew over the next uh, several years, he would be sent out on uh, military campaigns with his soldiers. Uh, he became a very uh, successful, uh, very capable military leader and uh, apparently was able to accomplish on his campaigns uh, what he was supposed to accomplish, and this aroused great jealousy in Saul, who attempted to kill David. Uh, there had been songs about David's popularity. Uh, Saul is killing his thousands and David is killing his ten thousands. And uh, the Bible suggests that Saul is developing um, depression and uh, descending into periods of uh, morose behavior and jealousy. And so when he attempted to uh, kill David, David had to flee. Uh, David was actually... Uh, befriended and uh, was warned of uh, the attempt on his life uh, by Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. Uh, again, contrary to popular belief, these were not two young boys who were friends. Uh, Jonathan was uh, probably 10 or 15 years older, maybe, maybe more than David, and their friendship was probably more along the lines of a mentor and a mentee or a protege uh, the kinds of relationships you see in the military where a senior officer uh, uh, befriends a young man with, um, uh, with promise and helps him in his career, and you see the same thing in the business world. At any rate, Jonathan uh, was, uh, cap was able to help David escape, and David fled with uh, uh, several hundred uh, soldiers who were his, uh, his supporters, and then he was pursued around the country uh, for a considerable period of time by the army of Saul. As I mentioned before, Israel is a uh, small country and there really aren't a lot of places where a large group of men can hide safely and uh, be supplied with food and water and, and uh, be protected. They would be seen by the local uh, citizenry and word would get back to Saul and then he would send his army to that region and try to track him down and we are given two specific episodes where uh, Saul uh, was vulnerable and could have been injured or killed by David and David chose not to do so. It's not known specifically where he uh, pursued, where, where Saul pursued David and where he went, but if you look at this slide of the uh, region of the Dead Sea, the uh, cliffs lining the Great Rift at that point are very rugged and are cut by dry riverbeds known as wadis, and one of those places is uh, En Gedi, uh, the spring of the Gedi. Uh, a Gedi is a small mountain goat, an Ain, E-I-N or Ain or En Gedi, uh, means the spring of the goats, and this was one place that has been uh, speculated as uh, a probable site for uh, David's, one of David's encounters with Saul. Uh, there's one other place known as the stronghold in the Bible, and it's quite possible that David was there as well. It's the site of Masada, which is located a little further south. Now, Masada has um, been uh, widely publicized uh, in the uh, time of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, but it was still a fortified, recognized stronghold in that area at that time. If we were to take a look at an aerial photo looking across the uh, Dead Sea, we're going to look specifically at the strongholds of Ein Gedi here. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see that there is a very rugged area uh, that happens to have water in it. Springs are coming down from the plateau, 
And in the very back of this valley is a, uh, is a cave which is identified as the cave uh, which was uh, where Saul and David uh, had their encounter back up in this corner. It's a lovely green lush area with uh, mountain goats and water and so it would have been an ideal place for uh, David to uh, have uh, tried to hide from Saul and here's a view looking back up uh, the Ain Gedi uh, area. Now with no place to hide David fled to the land of the Philistines. This is, uh, this is all he could do. The Philistines were uh, the enemies of the Israelites, of course, and uh, the Bible tells us that when Saul learned that David had uh, fled to the, to the Philistines, uh, he gave up his search for him. So David was safe and became uh, a mercenary for King Achish of the Philistines for about one and a half years. Uh, he wasn't trusted. Obviously, the Philistines... Um, would have been concerned about him and um, he was uh, sent out into the Negev basically on his various campaigns but he was able to convince them that he was indeed uh, functioning as a mercenary for the Philistines and uh, he stayed there for a year and a half but around 1010 BC uh, the Philistines massed to attack the Israelites at Mount Gilboa uh, David wasn't permitted by the Philistines to participate in that battle and in the battle three of the sons of uh, Saul died and King Saul committed suicide. It um, might have been interesting to see how that battle would have played out if David had been allowed to participate. He would have had Saul coming down from Mount Gilboa attacking the Philistines and perhaps David in the rear <laughs> working in a uh, pincher movement to help Saul. Once again, looking at the map, we can see that um, the Philistines had marched north to uh, Mount Gilboa, and it was there that uh, they fought and uh, killed King Saul, and uh, this is the view of Mount Gilboa that we talked about in our last session. Now, after the battle at Mount Gilboa, David was acclaimed as king of the tribe of Judah. He was able to return from the, uh, from the region of the Philistines and went back to his home tribe of Judah and centered his uh, activities in Hebron and was acclaimed as king of that tribe, which effectively took half of the territory that had been ruled by, um, by Saul. There was a surviving son of Saul. His name was Ishbosheth, and he claimed the throne of the northern part of Israel. And over the next two years, there were minor clashes between the two territories. Uh, these wouldn't have been uh, civil war as such, but there were skirmishes. Ishbosheth was an ineffective ruler, and he was assassinated after about two years. And David was asked to rule over the northern territories as well as his own. Um, I'm sure he very humbly and modestly agreed to do so. But uh, let's see how that played out on the maps here. We have the Israelites that were controlled uh, by Saul in the territory that you see in the blue here. But with the death of Saul, it was divided into two portions. The northern portion was claimed by Ishbosheth as the uh, son of Saul, but David uh, was able to take over the southern part, which essentially was the allotment of the tribe of Judah. His headquarters, his capital, was in Hebron, and uh, things went along uh, reasonably well for a couple of years until Ishbosheth was assassinated. And at that point, the, um, the uh, tribal leaders of the northern tribes uh, requested that David consent to rule over their territory as well. He was uh, an established military leader and a hero to the people and had been for 15 years. And so it's very reasonable that he would have been requested to uh, participate in their rule. And so with the passage of uh, just a couple of years after the death of Saul, David now controlled the entire territory that had been ruled by King Saul. After uh, seven years of rule in Hebron, David decided that he would conquer a fortified city to the north. That would be Jerusalem, and he would use it as his capital. 
Uh, at that time, it was not a large city. It was only about 10 acres inside the walls, but it was more centrally located and it was extremely well fortified. So it may be that uh, he considered it to be a more impressive city or something that was more central to the territory that he ruled. Let's take a look at where Jerusalem was located. It was to the north of Hebron, and it was to there uh, that David uh, took his army and uh, eventually conquered the city. Now, Jerusalem was a Canaanite stronghold at that time. It was occupied by a group of people known as Jebusites. It was called the city of, of the Jebusites, and so it was probably going by the name of Jebus or Jebus at that time. It was essentially impregnable. The Israelites were a, uh, uh, a small group of uh, footbound soldiers. There were no, uh, no chariots in this part of the country at that time. They didn't have the roads or the horses or the, the wherewithal to have chariot armies. Those would come at a later time. Uh, they had bows and arrows. They had slings. They had uh, spears. They had swords. But conquering a city on a hill like Jerusalem would have been impossible uh, they didn't have the forces necessary to uh, besiege the city for the two or three years that it might take to conquer it. But we are given a fantastic clue as to how David conquered the city in this particular passage in 2 Samuel. Uh, the, the Bible says that David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. And, uh, of course, it was named the city of David after he conquered it. But David said anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft. Now, there's been lots of discussion about the meaning of this passage. Uh, the the uh, Hebrew word is tzinor, and it generally, is, it's only used twice in the Bible, and in both cases, it carries the connotation of uh, transporting water. In one case, it's been translated as a tunnel in this particular case. Uh, in the other, it's in a psalm, and it talks about a waterfall. But it has some kind of a connection uh, with, with water passing uh, through a region. It obviously refers, in this case, to a tunnel of some sort. That's been agreed upon by uh, Bible scholars for some time, but there was no good candidate for such a tunnel until about 10 years ago. Uh, long ago, uh, for, for the last hundred years, there's a vertical shaft known as Warren's shaft that has been identified as the um, perhaps the Tsinor by which uh, David was able to gain entry into the city. But uh, a few years ago, geologists have demonstrated that that didn't exist at the time of David, and so uh, we have to eliminate that. Uh, there has also been, surprisingly, an agreement by scholars that Jerusalem never protected her water supply. Every other ancient city built either, they either built uh, foundations around their water supply or they buried them and tunneled to them or they created cisterns, but they made the water supply protected from any attacking army except for Jerusalem. Now, this seems a little far-fetched, but there was nothing to support the argument that the water supply had been protected until recently. Let's take a look at some pictures of Jerusalem here. The ancient city, as it's reconstructed now, uh, was surrounded by the Kidron Valley on the east and what's called the Central Valley on the, the west, and to the south, the Hinnom Valley, which is very, very steep and deep. And the water supply of Jerusalem was located to the east uh, in a spring that, was, that today is outside the city walls and down in the bottom of the Kidron Valley. As it turns out, uh, this area has largely been assumed to have been unprotected, which is um, uh, almost unbelievable when you're talking about a heavily fortified Canaanite city. New excavations have demonstrated, as you see in the circle here, that there was a fortified box built around the water supply, and so it was indeed well protected. Now, when they were digging this area, surprisingly, they found a tunnel that runs from the spring along the wall and outside the city that apparently carried water and was used, uh, at, at this point it's assumed it was used for irrigation. And if David were able to enter in through this tunnel, 
he would gain access into the fortification controlling the water and then um, would be able to uh, conquer the, uh, the troops that were guarding the gates, throw open the gates, and conquer the city. And as a result, it became the city of David. This is a wonderful story, and uh, it's only been recently that we've made this recent discovery, but um, if we summarize the young years of David, we find that a 15-year-old shepherd became a national hero by defeating Goliath. He survived numerous attempts by Saul to kill him, eventually took the throne of Israel upon the death of Saul. He conquered a nearly impregnable fortress of Jerusalem, and at that point, he looked around for new worlds to conquer. Now, that's what we're going to talk about in our next session. We'll look at the rest of his reign as he was centered in uh, Jerusalem. We'll look at the decline and conquest of the Philistines. We'll look at the various groups that David was required to combat, such as the uh, Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Arameans, uh, the fantastic story of David and Goliath, uh, the fathering of his um, um, most important son, Solomon, and ultimately the end of his reign. So this will be, uh, be a fun session, and I hope you'll join us. I look forward to that. Bible Interact is a group of Bible scholars and biblical archaeologists who promote the Hebraic nature of Scripture and view the two Testaments as one unified message. They explain how they use a first century approach to searching the Scriptures, and they share their methods and discoveries for discussion and dialogue. They invite your comments and participation on BibleInteract.tv, where you can also find more teachings, self-study quizzes, webinars, and interviews.